Welcome to Bible Tract Echoes. This program is the radio ministry of Bible Tracts Incorporated. Our mission is to take the Word of God to all the world. Our Bible teacher is the director of Bible Tracts, Pastor Mark Smith. Since 1938, Bible Tracts Incorporated has been publishing clear gospel tracts and supplying them to churches, missionaries, and individuals all over the world, and all at no charge. Information on how you can receive a free sample pack of our tracts will be given at the end of this broadcast. Now for our Bible study, here is our teacher, Pastor Mark Smith. Welcome, my friend. Welcome to the broadcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. We've got a lot to do. If you can, reach over and pick up your own copy of God's Word. It will really be a help to you today, particularly today. Uh, My Bible sits open to Hebrews chapter 2. We're going to try and cover verses 11 to 18 today. A lot of ground. Get your Bible. Get something to write with, please. I've got a gospel tract here in my hand I want to talk about, but I want to jump in with my question. Now, yesterday on the broadcast, I asked this question. Why did the second person of the Trinity allow himself to be to take on flesh and to be born as a baby in Bethlehem? I could ask the question in a shorter form to just say this. Why the incarnation of Jesus? Now, while it may not be the Christmas season right now, this question is too critical, too vital for us to only be answering at Christmas time. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 through 18 gives us eight reasons for Jesus to be born as a human being, to, for him to come and share the flesh life of humanity. I hope you do have pen and paper ready to jot down these eight reasons. They are so key. They're key, by the way, for why you and I explain to people why Jesus is our Savior. As I said a moment ago, I'm going to need to move quickly today. So having your Bible open, I think, will really be a help to you. I'm going to be focusing on verses 11 to 18. And if I had to boil these eight verses, verses 11 to 18 down, I had to boil them down to a simple statement, my statement would be this. Believers are united to Christ and he has called us his brothers. Believers are united. They're connected to Christ and he has called us his brothers. Wow. Jesus owns me, my friend. Jesus owns you, my fellow believer, as his brother. What an encouraging thing to be said about it. That ought to put a shout in our mouth and a shout of encouragement in our soul. Let's open God's word. I could use some encouragement today. Probably so could you. Now, friend, before I go any farther and even read some of the scripture, I want to talk to you about the gospel tract in my hand. Now, please know a gospel tract is simply a written presentation of the gospel, the good news of salvation found in the person of Jesus Christ. Salvation is not found in a particular church. Salvation is not found in what you can do for God. The salvation is found in what Jesus has done for us at Calvary. He died. His blood was shed to pay for our sins. He was buried. He really actually died and he rose again from the dead so that you and I might know for a fact his saving work was enough and that you and I might not fear death. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Now, the gospel tract in my hand right now is entitled, A Would-Be Suicide. A Would-Be Suicide, it opens with a true story of a man, very much as an adult, who had become broken by life. He was going to commit suicide. He was having his last meal. He had his gun ready, but then he saw a teenage girl a 16-year-old girl do something that drove his life to Christ. Oh, friend, not only does this gospel track tell the gospel clearly, it would be a great encouragement for your teenage son, daughter, your grandchild, your teenagers in your church to know that there are adults that are watching them. Their life can impact a whole lot of people if they will live their life for Christ. What this 16-year-old girl did was simple, but it was powerful. 
Oh, friend, get this track. You'll find out what she did. At the end of my broadcast, my announcer is going to come back on, give you three different ways by which you can communicate to us. In so doing, give us your name, give us your mailing address. We will send you a complete sample packet containing one each of all of our English gospel tracks. That's absolutely free of charge. Please, let's you and I become partners in doing the work of the gospel. All right, I'm coming here to uh, Hebrews chapter 2. I'm going to read verse 11 right now. It says this, For he, Jesus, that sanctifieth, and they that are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. I'm going to verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he, Jesus, also himself likewise took part of the same, that purpose statement coming now, that through death he might destroy him that had the power power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. I'm going to stop there for right now. So what are those eight reasons behind why Jesus came and took on flesh and dwelt among us? Yesterday, I gave reasons number one, two, and three. Let me repeat them and then jump into number four. Here we go. Number one, we said yesterday, Jesus came as the perfect man to fulfill God's purpose for man. He came as the perfect man to fulfill God's purpose for man. That takes up verses five through nine. Number two. Jesus came to die for every man, verse 9 says. I don't know how much more simple and clear I can say that. Christ came to die for every man, verse 9. Number three, Jesus came to bring many sons to glory. That's based upon verse 10. Christ came to bring many sons to glory, to heaven. All right, that was a repeat from yesterday. Now let's jump into reason number four. Why did Christ come and take on flesh and dwell among us? Reason number four, based upon verse 14, is this. Christ came to destroy the devil, to destroy the devil. Now that word destroy there in verse 14 means, well, it does not mean to annihilate, but it means to put out of business put out of business. A grocery store that's been put out of business, they can't sell you any food anymore. They can't fulfill their purpose. A roofing company that's been put out of business can't fix your roof anymore. They can't fulfill their purpose. Well, what was Satan's purpose? Satan's purpose, his business, is to enslave people and take them all the way to hell. But Jesus broke his power to enslave people. The the enslavement business, Satan was good at. But through Christ's death, he has broken his business. Satan can no longer enslave you if you want to be free. Come to Christ. Jesus said, if the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. And to any and all that come to him, he will in no wise cast out. You can come, whoever you are, whatever you've done, Jesus will set you free from the enslavement of sin and the devil. That was number four. Reason number five, why the incarnation? Jesus came to deliver us from the fear of death. That's what verse 15 says, the fear of death. Death really ought to be a fearful thing to people because it's an unknown. Well, it's unknown unless you happen to know somebody who did die and return to tell you about it. And that's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus sets us free. He removes from us from he removes us from the realm of fear because we know what our life will be like after death. To be absent from the body is what? Absolutely, it's to be present with the Lord. That was four and five. Reason number six, Jesus came to be our priest. Verses 16 and 17 talk about this. He came to be our priest. Look at verse 17. It says, wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. Now, let me stop right there. I'm going to pick up the last part here in just a moment. Jesus came to be our priest. Now, the job of the priest was in part to enable sinners to gain forgiveness by helping them offer a sacrifice for their sin. Well, what was Jesus doing at Calvary? 
He bore our burden, our sin burden there, and he paid our sin debt. He was our priest. He was the priest making the offering, and he was the offering being made. Reason number seven. Jesus came to make reconciliation for our sins. I stopped and near the end of verse 17. Verse 17 ends this way, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Let me ask, are you familiar with the word propitiation? Propitiation. That word is used three times in the Bible, and it means to satisfy and was used in reference to a money debt that you might have or somebody might have to another person. It means their money debt was satisfied. The word reconciliation here in verse 17 translates the very word propitiation or to satisfy. Jesus fully satisfied our sin debt to God. And by so doing, a person who receives Christ as their Savior will have the status of their soul changed. Let me say that again. Anybody who receives Christ will have the status of their soul changed. Before they receive Christ, they are an enemy and an outcast to God. But now, through making Christ their Savior, they will be God's child. They will have a clear and clean relationship to God. That's why Christ came. Reason number eight, last reason in this passage is this. Jesus came in the flesh to help believers in their times of testing and temptation. Verse 18 says, for in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor or help them that are tempted. The word tempted here is used twice. Years ago, a Bible prof of mine said this. He said, behind every temptation or test, whether it's a temptation to commit sin or a test of physical hardship and suffering, behind it all is a test to see whether you and I will do God's will or do God's way or if we'll live independently of God, live on our own. You remember Isaiah 53, 6? He says, we all have turned everyone to his own way, living independently of God. Oh, friend, living independent of God's will has one very, well, ugly title to it. It's called rebellion. Jesus suffered in the flesh to succor or help us to live as he did, obeying God's will. All right, I've given you the eight reasons found here for for why Jesus took on flesh and lived among men. But let me simply say that these eight reasons here are given to make one bigger point. Uh, These are eight sub points to help us teach one greater point. That one greater point is described there in verse 11. For both he, Jesus, that sanctifieth and they, believers who are sanctified, are all of one. For which cause Jesus is not ashamed to call them brethren. The point is, believers are connected to Jesus and he calls us his brothers. This verse says we're sanctified, set apart for God. We need to live like it. This verse says our source is that we are of the same source of Jesus. Jesus was born of the flesh by the power of the Spirit over Mary. You and I are born into God's family by the power of the Spirit in our sin-dead life, and he regenerates us. And then we're told here at the end of the verse 11, there's no stigma. Jesus is not ashamed of us, no matter what you've done. You may be a prisoner in prison today, and you're there because you've committed a heinous crime. Dear friend, if you've received Christ, Jesus is not ashamed to call you his brother. Glory to God. Thank you for joining us today for Bible Tract Echoes. If you would like to receive a free sample packet of our tracks, you can contact us by calling 309-828-6888. Our mailing address is Bible Tracks, P.O. Box 188, Bloomington, Illinois, 61702. Again, our phone number is 309-828-6888. And our mailing address is P.O. Box 188, Bloomington, Illinois, 61702. You can also contact us through our website. Our web address is BibleTracksInc.org. Remember, the word tracks is spelled T-R-A-C-T-S. That address is BibleTracksInc.org. May the Lord richly bless you as you serve Him.